Good morning again, Redeemer family. It is so good to see you. It's good to be back with you on this beautiful Lord's Day. And uh, we're going to jump back into 1 Corinthians. And um, you might remember the last time we were in 1 Corinthians was three months ago. And I actually skipped 1 Corinthians 14. I reminded you of a pastor out of Nashville who took sabbatical. And the first day of his sabbatical was his last day of life on earth. The Lord took him home through a tragic car accident. And I wrestled with my own mortality. And I said, Lord, if, if you go take me out of here on sabbatical, what's the last thing I want my people to hear? And that's the good news that Jesus has overcome death and the grave. But the Lord did not take me home. And so we're back. And, um, and so we got to go back to 1 Corinthians 14. I will say that these next couple chapters are some of the hardest ones in the scriptures. We're going to talk about tongues and prophecy and the interpretation of tongues. I want to draw your attention to the uh, position paper, the pastoral letter that's under your reflection quote. Uh, I'll spend a little time kind of defining what tongues are, what I think they are, what prophecy maybe was and maybe what it is right now since the canon is closed and there is no new revelation. God has spoken to us by the prophets and in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. And so the best a prof prophet can do is timely apply God's revealed word to us. But I don't think that's the, the question to wrestle with in the passage is what are tongues or, or what is prophecy? I think the bigger question to answer is what is the purpose for our gathering and what spiritual gift tongues or prophecy does paul see best serving that agenda and once you understand that then i think the light is kind of shined on the passage and so we'll get there but i want to make a slight change to the title the new title is regularly gathering with god's people essential or optional regularly gathering with god's people is that something that is essential to your life? Or is it something where God says, hey, you, you got the option to do what you want to do. Show up one week. Don't show up for a month. Show up again. Which one is true? And which one is for your best? And which, is, which one is by God's design? So let's read 1 Corinthians 14, 1 through 25. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God, for no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, brothers and sisters, I want you all to speak in tongues, but what I want more is that you all would prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. Now, brothers and sisters, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? If even lifeless instruments such as the flute or the harp do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So it is with yourselves. If with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what you're saying? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none with is about without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church therefore the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may or he or may someone else may interpret for if i pray in a tongue my spirit prays but my mind is unfruitful what am i to do i pray with my spirit but i will pray with my mind also i will sing praise with my spirit but i will sing with my mind also otherwise if you give thanks with your spirit how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you're saying for you may be giving thanks well enough but the other person is not being built up 
I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. In the law, it is written, by people of strained tongues and by lips of foreigners will I speak to this people. And even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus, signs are not, tongues are not a sign for believers, but for unbelievers. For prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. If therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say you are out of your minds? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called into account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. Amen. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, your word is beautiful and true and good. And your servant this morning, Lord, is in uh, need of unction of your spirit to rightly divide the word of truth. Father, I pray what Paul desires, that you would use your word as it is plainly communicated to build up, encourage, console, instruct, and benefit your people. Might you do this that your name would be praised. In Jesus' name I pray this. Amen. So the church in Corinth had a lot of problems. And as does every church, right? We, we, are, we are believers. We're born again. We're new. We're saints. And at the same time, we have uh, sin in our members, right? And so there is no perfect, perfect church. But you, you kind of got to say, like, what is up with this church in Corinth? And in case you've never read 1 Corinthians 1 through 10, here's kind of my summary of what was going on in the church. First, they exalted other leaders and belittled other leaders. I follow Paul. I follow Cephas. I follow Apollos. I follow Jesus. And so they were very divisive, right? And then that's not even to mention the sexual sins that you see mentioned in this book. There was incest. There was prostitution. There were married couples denying sexual intimacy with one another. They flirted with demons when they partook of the pagan feast. They used their freedom to cause others to sin. They got drunk off the communion wine. They let the poor people, they pushed them to the side and let the wealthy people have first dibs on the supper. Right. You look at like, what is wrong with this church? That's first Corinthians kind of one through 10. And then something unique happens in first Corinthians 11 through 14. Paul pivots and he talks about their worship, their conduct when they got together. And here's what I think Paul is doing. Paul is actually saying because of the problems y'all have in first Corinthians 11 through 14, the way you behave when you gather, then guess why you're living the way you live when you scatter? Something is off with how you're behaving and how you're viewing the, the, the holy assembly of gathering with God's people. If we gather rightly and worship the God of the Bible rightly when we gather, guess what? We're going to be better equipped to live lives when we scatter. But if we play it this right here, deprioritize this right here, do what we want to do right here, then guess what? I don't even got to guess how we're living out here because we're missing the main thing. And so here's what I want to say to you this morning. Gathering with God's people week in and week out, not when you feel like it, when you don't feel like it, to worship and enjoy Jesus together. When done with order and optimism, reverence and regularity is powerful to change you and grow you in grace. Why? Because God has lodged inside of every single Christian gifts that build us up and are on display when used correctly when you're together. And we experience this best 
not on our own or in isolation, but as we are a part, an integral part of a community of Christians. And so is regularly gathering with God's people essential or is it optional? You bet your life that it's essential. And that's what the passage is about. And so I got I got three points. They all begin with a P and then I'm going to sneak in a fourth point that also begins with a P. But I'm a, that's kind of the conclusion. Y'all with me? Here's the first point. There is a priority of regularly gathering with God's people in the Bible. It's it's all over the scriptures. Now, let me show you. Now, I already mentioned what is first Corinthians 11 through 14 about. Y'all talk to me. What is it about their conduct when? When they came together. Now, remember in 1 Corinthians 11, when you come together, that's not the Lord's Supper you're taking. When you come together, already eat your food. Don't, 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 don't come here and get drunk. When you come together, you're not coming together the right way. When you come together, right, that's the refrain you see all in chapter 11. And then in chapter 12, it's implied. And then in chapter 13, which is the famous chapter about love in Corinthians, it's not a marriage scripture it's actually a worship scripture when you gather together don't be like this rather embody love right now look in our passage and you see the same thing look at verse 19 nevertheless in church i would rather speak five words with my mind than ten thousand words in a language nobody knows what i'm speaking Look at verse 23. If therefore the whole church comes together and all speaks in tongues and outsiders and unbeliever enter, they enter what? They enter into the sacred assembly. Look at verse 24. If all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, you got to ask the question, enters what? Enters you. In settings like this, when we gather you can make the case that this has always been on Paul's mind. Remember earlier in the book when the man had sex with his father's wife? You remember what Paul says? He says, when you assemble, the spirit of the Lord is with you. And when you assemble, you are to hand this man over to Satan. You remember when they were suing one another? And Paul says, how dare you go out and assemble with unbelievers? Is there not any one of you in the sacred assembly who can mediate this conflict between two brothers? Do you see what Paul assumes? He assumes that gathering with God's people in worship. And when your life is falling apart and when you need discipline and when you need people to mediate conflict, he assumes that the first place you'll go is the church. And I don't mean a building. I mean amongst God's people. Now, why? Because sanctification is a communal endeavor. So how many of you know Super Mario? All right. Well, guess what? I'm not talking about Luigi's brother or cousin. I'm talking about this cat. His name is Mario Salcedo. Y'all with me? So he has the world record for time spent on a cruise ship. Since the year 2000, he has spent every year living on a cruise ship. With the exception of 15 months during COVID and 15 days of every month of, of every year where cruise ships have to be recertified, where everybody has to leave. This guy has spent 23 years living on cruise ships. And he says, I'm the happiest man in the world. I have all of my time. I don't have to wash my own clothes. I don't have to wash dishes. I don't have to make my bed. I don't have to cook my food. I don't have to clean up. He keeps going on what I don't have to do. And now he has all of this time, right? One author says he's lying. And here's what he says. The problem is that his lifestyle is predicated on a misunderstanding about time. 
Super Mario sees time as a resource that is more valuable to you the more of it you have to yourself. Yet the truth is that time is a network good, one that derives its true value from how many other people have access to your time and how well their portion of time is coordinated with yours. Having all the time in the world isn't much use if you experience it by yourself. We are made to go out on dates and socialize and raise children and launch businesses and do life with people whose calendars are in sync with ours. Y'all catch that? So look, I know this. I've been on sabbatical for three months and y'all the first eight weeks. Awesome. And then guess what happened after, after about week eight? My wife is like, babe, I got to go back to work. <laughs> and my kids started school. And I got all this time on my hand. And, and I'm around here looking out the window. Baby, when are you coming back home, right? <laughs> and then I start missing you all. Why? Because when you sabbatical, I didn't realize that you're taking a break from ministry. But it was a death. Because... I do life with you and I love you and I love to see what God is doing in you and you know me. And so I can attest that the time is good, but man, it is really good when our schedules are stacked and we're doing life together. And what Paul says is your sanctification is a network project. You will not grow in isolation. Why? God has so wired us to need to grow as we coordinate time with other believers. Now, why? It's because when we gather, this is another book that I read, is, is You Are What You Love. The author says this, rival truths vie for our hearts day in and day out. And gathering with God's people in Christian worship is a recalibration and a rehabituation project. He says, you will not be liberated from the lies of the world by new information obtained on your own in isolation. He says, rather, what God does is repeatedly deliver us from deformation and these habits that, that rival him through gathering together in the embodied divine liturgies of Jesus. And as we gather and worship and sit under the word and pray and confess sins and sing and remind it that we're pardoned and meditate on scripture, as we do this over and over and over again, what God does is he takes the compass of our hearts, which tend to, to, to turn south towards the world or towards the flesh or towards the devil and what god does through our liturgies is bend them back north towards our first love jesus this is an encouragement and a warning right it's an encouragement because sometimes following jesus can be daunting and we can lose our way and we don't know what we ought to know and we don't feel like we're growing. And what Jesus says, baby, I got an easy first step for you. Just go get with other Christians. It's the easy first step. Prioritize the bride. And it's also a warning that we live in an age where people are trashing the church. We come to church when we want to and when we feel like it. We deprioritize the Lord's day. We sleep in. We do virtual stuff. We have all these reasons why this sacred assembly is unimportant. And I'm here to tell you the quickest way to shipwreck your faith is to live in isolation. That's the first point. There's a priority. There's an assumption which moves us to our second point, right? What's the correct posture 
when gathering with God's people. So let's say, right, we, we, we have prioritized, Pastor Ariel, I get it. I should value being with the body in worship, in prayer, in studying, in growth groups, in life on life. All right, now here's the thing. We can still mess this up because guess what? We can enter into these spaces the wrong way. And what Paul is actually reminding the Corinthians is once there is a priority of the sacred assembly, you still got to check your heart before you enter into it. So what's the right posture when we prioritize gathering with God's people? Now, to get at this, I want to look at 1 Corinthians 12. Then I want to come back to this section. Now, in 1 Corinthians 12, this is what Paul writes. Now concerning spiritual gifts, there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit, varieties of service, but the same Lord, variety of activities, but the same God who empowered them all and everyone for two. Now, now this is where you got to listen with me because it's going to have direct implications for this passage. For to one is given through the spirit utterance of wisdom, another knowledge, another faith, another gifts of healing, another the working of miracles, another prophecy, same word here, another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another the various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of those tongues. Now, all of these are empowered by the one and the same spirit who apportions them individually to each one of us as he wills. I just said a lot, but track with me, all right? Now, did you notice that Father, Son, and Spirit have a say in the gifts that you give? Did you notice that there are many spiritual gifts? There's a ton of them, and every believer gets a or some of them. Now, John Frame, in his book, Salvation Belongs to the Lord, he goes on to say that the, the biblical list of gifts are not exhaustive. They even differ from Romans to 1 Corinthians to Ephesians to 1 Peter. He says any divinely given ability granted by the spirit that edifies the church should be considered a spiritual gift. Some of these are related to our natural abilities like teaching and mercy and administration. Others appear to be more supernatural like tongues and prophecy and healing. He says, but I would not hesitate to say that the ability to sing and worship is a spiritual gift. The ability to cook meals in mass for church gatherings is a gift. Mercy ministry is a gift. The ability to manage finances is a gift. Now think about this. Imagine we had all the spiritual gifts that are mentioned in the Bible and what John Frame says, there are even other things like using your car to go pick up somebody to bring them to church, right? Or all these gifts, these talents, these passions. Now imagine I had a bowl and every single one of the gifts that are possible are in the bowl. And then here we are in the sacred assembly. Well, when you met Jesus, do you know what the Holy Spirit did? He reached inside the bowl and he gave some to you. He reached back in and gave some to you. And you two may have similar gifts. He reached in and gave some to you so that everything a local body needs for the building of the saints has been dispersed by the Holy Spirit. Now, here's where it gets really good, because it says that the Holy Spirit does this as he wills. You got to underline that. You know what that means? That means that the Holy Spirit didn't say, hey, Pastor L, which gift you want? He said, I'm not asking you. I'm God. I give you what I want you to have. Right? You got th th that's how big he is here when it comes to giving us gifts. He is so big that he doesn't ask your permission. He says, I'm going to come in and I'm going to make you be able to sing and nobody in your house can hold a note. I'm going to come in and, and, and implant this longing to play piano, right? And all your friends, no, no, none of them want to play piano, right? I'm going to give you this ability to preach the gospel. And you know what? You actually don't like being in front of people in this way, right? The Holy Spirit says, look, I'm God. You're not. I give you what I want you to have. Now, here is what else the Holy Spirit does. He also says, I'm God. And I choose which gifts not to give you. Let that simmer in. 
He is sovereign both over your gifts and what you're not gifted at. And that's what's happening in Corinthians. That's why Paul says, look, y'all speaking in tongues, but guess what? There is no one to interpret. So you might have the gift, but because the Holy Spirit ain't giving you nobody in the church to interpret what you're saying, you ought to be quiet. Right? That, that's the Bible. That ain't me. Because he's sovereign over the gifts. And speaking in tongues is a different gift than interpretation of tongues. So if you have tongues being spoken in a church and nobody is interpret, interpreting, you don't have to pray for the will of God. You know the will of God. It is not to do that. You catch what, what Paul is saying? And you know what this means, beloved? It means that the right posture for every one of us as we enter into the sacred assembly is this. You are needed because God has gifted you uniquely. And you are needy because you don't have all the gifts. You, you catch that? And who is Lord and sovereign over it all? The Holy Spirit. If you got to take issue up with that, you take an issue up with God. Here's what this means. It means that every growth group you show up to, every time you walk in the door of the church, every time you serve on a committee, you show up able to bless the body and in deep need of the body. And guess what? That's the right posture. You see, we can mess this up, and this is what they were doing wrongly in Corinth. The people with the gift of tongues showed up. We got tongues, and we're going to exercise the gift. The party don't start till we get here. And what Paul is actually saying, brothers and sisters, you're thinking too highly of yourself. And we can still do that today, where we think we're the greatest gift of God's church. And we can also get off base the other way, right? where we think we have nothing to contribute. Lord, I'm old and the church is young and I don't fit. And what God says to you, you gray haired, wise man or woman. No, we need you. Well, Lord, I don't have the gift of preaching and teaching, right? And the Lord is saying, you don't need to have the gift of preaching and teaching. Who's going to be back here praying while the service is going on? Who's going to be keeping us uh, focused on the poor and being merciful and kind? Who's going to care for the children? Who's going to wash the feet of the saints? Who's going to open their homes? We can give all of these reasons why we are not good enough. And what Jesus is saying is, do you not know that I have gifted you to be important and vital to a body? Think about now. Yeah, I'm up here preaching. Somebody running the podcast, somebody putting it online. Somebody came in here and got the air conditioning on for y'all and y'all just kind of walked in and it's automatically 70 degrees. Somebody made coffee. Somebody's watching your children right now. On Thursday night when you were having supper, the musicians and the vocalists were here at the church pretty late practicing. You see what's happening? In a body, we're needy and we're needed. And that's the posture. So I've been watching these pregame liturgies of, of sports people. Coco Golf and her father, before every tennis match, they pray and he imparts some words. LeBron James used to go to the center of the basketball court and put his hand in powder and throw it in the air. Deion Sanders and Shadur, they have a pregame ritual where Deion walks down the sideline with Shadur and he says, I'm walking down this sideline right now as your father. When we turn back and go this way, I'm not daddy right now, I'm coach. 
These are pre-game liturgies before they step into this space. What if, beloved, before every single assembly with God's people, you had a pre-game liturgy where before you showed up in the space, you bow before Jesus and said, Jesus, despite how I feel, I am so needed and valuable and gifted by you. And Lord, I so need the other people because I don't have all the gifts and you're sovereign. And this is according to your own plan. That's how you show up into the sacred assembly. And that's what Paul is pushing against in the passage, which moves us to our final point, And it's the most difficult one. If gathering is important and coming correctly is essential, we can never lose sight of why we gather. And we're going to look at a few purposes of our gathering. All right. So we got to deal with the elephant in the room and the elephant in the room is tongues. Speaking in tongues and, and what is prophecy? I'm going to spend like one minute on it. Then I'm going to refer you to this reflection quote that's at the beginning of your bulletin, which comes from a larger paper that was published in 1973 by our denomination on these things. If you want to know where your pastor is, your pastor is he lands there. So go read the fuller document and then come ask me questions. We good? All right. So what's tongues? That there are options, right? On the one hand, it appears to be a supernatural gift of speaking a known language. And you see this in the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit descends and these uh, ordinary people begin to speak a real language. And those people in a language that they never learned. And those people who were from all over the world heard the gospel in their native language. So that's tongues. But you can also piece together, especially parts of 1 Corinthians 14, that this could also be a heavenly language that no one knows but God and those who have the gift of interpretation from the God who inspired the language. Right. So th that's kind of my take on what's happened. What's, what's prophecy? Is it a foretelling of the future? I think at, at some points it was. In the book of Acts, you see Acts 13, there were prophets and teachers in the church of Antioch. Acts 11, prophets came down from Jerusalem and told them that there would be a great famine. Acts 21, a prophet told Paul, thus saith the Holy Spirit, the man who is bound with this belt will be taken captive to Jerusalem. And he was talking about Paul. So I do think at some point, right, in, in before the Bible was closed, that you had these people by the spirit who, who knew things that, 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 that mere mortals didn't know. Now, because I believe that this, the Bible is closed because Paul, uh, the, the author of Hebrews says long ago in many times, in many ways, God spoke to us by the prophets in these final days. He speaks to us through his son. And so we believe that Jesus is the quintessential final true big prophet, capital P. And we also believe that anyone who has maybe the gift of prophecy now, you're not telling me new revelation. The best you can do is timely apply what comes out of this book. Y'all with me there? Now, do tongues continue today? I'm going to say go read that paper, right? But what if that's the wrong question? What if the right, the, the right question isn't, what is tongues and do they exist today? What if the best question, the question that Paul would have us ask is, what's the purpose of our gathering? And once you discern the purposes for which we gather, then you can ask, which spiritual gift best suits those purposes? Now you understand what Paul is comparing and contrasting tongues. He's going to land and say, look, I ain't got an issue with tongues. I speak more tongues than all of you. But for the purposes of our gathering, you want to know what's most important? Speaking five words 
plainly in the language of the people you're with than 10,000 words from a language none of you can understand. Why? Because of the purposes of our gathering. Now, why do we gather? The first reason we gather is to give glory to God. We gather to respond corporately to his kindness, his mercy, his love, his grace. What can we give a God who has given us everything? On the one hand, you can give God nothing but your sin. And once Jesus atones for your sin, guess what we get to give God? Everything. My body is yours. My heart is yours. My hands are yours. My, my eyes are yours. My mind is yours. I am now yours. That's the right way to respond to a God who gives us everything. And that's what you see happening in verse 25. This unbeliever who because of timely spoken truths about God and the gospel sees plainly his condition and bows the knee and notice what he does we fall on our faces and we worship God so we gather first and foremost for this it's vertical it's upward but that's not it we also gather for the horizontal so we gather to give glory to God. Second, we gather for the good of other believers. By my math, Paul says building up six times. He says the one who prophesies speaks to other people for their upbuilding, but the one who speaks in tongues builds himself up. Look at verse five, so that the church may be built up. Look at verse 12, strive to excel in building up the church. This is an Old Testament concept. God promised that I'm going to build a temple and its glory now is going to exceed its former glory. And on the one hand, that new temple is Jesus Christ. And what Paul has already said in 1 Corinthians, guess what? The temple is also. It's you. You being built up into a house brick by brick for the Holy Spirit to dwell in our midst. And what Paul is saying, we gather to put each other in place. We gather so that each one of us become fit inside of this dwelling place of God. But that's not it. He says we gather to encourage. That means you heard Grant today. Some of us are going to show up in here tired and weary and confused. And when you gather here, it is not to make you more confused and more tired you're here to be encouraged up we're here to console we're here to benefit the other person we're here to instruct these are all reasons why we gather we gather to be a blessing to other people as we put our own gifts given to us by the spirit on display to build other people up in jesus that's why we gather other christians and they're good. But we also gather for non-Christians to bring them in. And if there is an obstruction that keeps non-believers from clearly hearing that Jesus is the hero your heart was made for, that sin is rebellion against God, that God is the great pursuer of his people. If anything gets in front of that, even if it's tongues, then Paul says, remove the barrier. Let them hear five words about Jesus and not 10,000 words of what they have no idea. Now notice what he says. If the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders and unbelievers enter, will they not say, y'all are out of your minds? But if all of you prophesy, taking scripture and applying it, and an unbeliever hears you plainly applying scripture, then they will fall on their faces and worship the Lord. Now you understand the rest of the chapter. Which gift best, and this is best, does all of the above you speak in tongues nobody knows what you're saying but you and god okay you check the god box but do you check the box of building up unbelievers nope 
do you check the box of removing a barrier from non-believers? Nope. You so, so you see what Paul says? I ain't got nothing against tongues. I'm just saying if we're gathering to give glory to God and bless other people, can you imagine somebody coming to church and they just lost their spouse or a child or their marriage is on the rocks and they come to you and pour their hearts out and then you start speaking in a language that they don't know? Are they consoled? Do they encounter Jesus there? No. And so Paul says, Corinthians, I speak in more tongues than all of you. But when the saints gather for these purposes, I'm going to speak five words in plain, clear, intelligible speech. And God going to run it up. Beloved, this means that when we gather, it's not to perform. It's not because our parents made us. It's not because we're out to make a name for ourselves. We gather to give glory to the Lord. We gather with an eye towards building up, consoling, encouraging, instructing God's people. And we do this as we rightly talk about this, pray, confess sins, point people to Jesus, and sometimes even correction. And we gather because there are unbelievers in our midst. Unbelievers can meet Jesus at your dinner table. Praise God. But Paul also believes that unbelievers best see the glory of God in the church. Which moves us to our conclusion. Where is our power to do this? We live in a day and an age where church participation is so optional. It's so sporadic. We got online stuff. We feel like it one day. We don't feel like it the next. We're tired. We got church hurt. Do I really want to go see those people who did this? Where's our power to stay at it? First, Jesus himself loved the church. That when you saw Jesus, you found him where? At the temple. He loved the house of God. You found him in the tabernacle, even though he had beef with the religious leaders. You always found him with his disciples. And you get this beautiful line that Jesus is a boy and he's standing on the steps of the temple talking about God. And his mama and daddy, they like way down here and they realize, uh oh, where's Jesus? And they go back and you know where Jesus is? He's on the temple talking to people, reasoning about God, being in his father's house. And the text says Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. How? Because he prioritized being where God promised to be. And that is amongst his people. Now, if Jesus, who is the God man, grew in wisdom and stature by prioritizing God's people, who are we to think that we can grow a different way? Secondly, Jesus, the God man, had a lot of gifts. He was a healer. <laughs> he was a miracle worker. He discerned spirits. Like if you go back and look at those gifts, you could go about through all of them and say, yep, Jesus had that. Yep, Jesus had that. Yep, Jesus had that. But here's the thing. You know what Jesus didn't have? A house to lay his head. The Bible says he was rich and for our sake he became poor. So Jesus lived upon the earth with nowhere to lay his head. And so when he hosted dinner parties, he says, come here, Zacchaeus, I'm borrowing your house today, right? I ain't got a house, but your house going to be my house for a little while. Think about administration. Who handled the money? Jesus didn't handle the money. He says Judas and them handled the money. 
Like, like think about who you see in Jesus. You see Jesus as amazingly gifted and you see Jesus as needy. Right? And he had the greatest gift, his life and his obedience. Hey, y'all worry about them houses. Y'all worry about this money. I'm worried about this thing right here, this kingdom of God and me going to this cross to die on it. And Satan, I don't want your wealth. Matter of fact, I'm going to get so far away from it that I'm not tempted by it. I'm going to let y'all handle that. And what you see in the God man is super giftedness. And humility and neediness. And that same spirit is inside of you. You're gifted because of your union with Jesus. And like your Savior, you also need friends and the covenant community. Is church participation essential or optional? It depends on if you want to grow. If you want to grow up and be built up, this is essential. May it be so. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your kindness to us. Thank you for your word. I pray Paul's prayer today that you would build us up and spur us on. Forgive us, Lord, for the ways that we deprioritize the sacred assembly. Change our hearts. Let us all see, Lord, that we are needy and needed. Lord, thank you for Jesus, who though he was God, did not count equality with you as something to be grasped, but he humbled himself and he went to a cross to offer us, Lord, a gift that has no value, of, of immense value. Father, I pray for those who don't know you. Might today be a day where they see their need and bow the knee to Jesus because something simple and plain and as clear as the gospel has been exalted. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen.